Good morning. It is 8 a.m. and we are ready to begin. We're really excited about today's program and you must be too because we've almost filled the seats. Um, we had several requests for this program and we always encourage you if there's anything you would like to hear about to present those ideas to us. It's uh, quite a challenge to come up with 52 programs each year. So if you have ideas, we're happy to hear those. The request was for canals. So I started doing some research into, I thought too, what a great idea. I've always wondered about the canals. I've heard about the Gunnison Tunnel, and I've researched that, but I, the canals seem a wonder to me. So when I started doing research, I came up with some really interesting things. Some of them you got in the email. Um, the first was in the late 1800s, the people who lived here started digging the ditches and canals. And if you think about no back hose, no front end loaders, no dump trucks, that had to be quite a task. But they were only being able to draw water from the Uncompahgre River, and we all know how that goes up and down. So they needed a better idea. And the fact that all of this was happening between the 1890s and 1902, 1903, was absolutely amazing. So I contacted Steve Pope and said, the main man in charge of all of this, and said, would you come speak to Forum um, about this whole system? As I did my research, I was also amazed to find that Uncompahgre Valley Water Users Association began in 1902. And today is in charge of the Taylor Park Dam and Reservoir, Gunnison Tunnel, seven diversion dams, 128 miles of main canals, 438 miles of laterals, and 216 miles of drains serving over 83,000 acres. I don't know how he sleeps at night. <laughs> that is a big job. Uh, the other things that I found interesting were that this project, specifically I think the tunnel, was the first Bureau of Reclamation project in the United States, which is why President Taft showed up here to dedicate it. And the other thing I found in earlier research was that the Gunnison Tunnel is still listed as one of the top 25 engineering feats in the United States because at the time they did it just using geometry. And they were only off by inches. Yeah, uh, much closer than the Eisenhower Tunnel. <laughs> so, so that's pretty amazing. I don't want to steal Steve's thunder. We are really honored to have Steve Pope, the manager of Uncompahgre Valley Water Users Association, formerly with the Colorado Division of Water Resources. That's a mouthful. Um, we're very pleased to have him as our speaker today. Please give him a warm welcome. Thank you very much. As, as Kathy, she, I mean, she told you everything about the system. We don't need to go over anything else. Um, you know, that, yeah, I wanted to start today uh, just a little bit of the history of the system, how we developed over the years, 
where we sit today and some of the challenges that we face. Um, as Kathy mentioned, you know, the Young Compadre Valley Water Users was formed in 1902. As they developed, you know, silver mining took place in the upper um, silver to Ure, Silverton, and they identified this vast resource of irrigable, potentially irrigable land in the Uncompahgre Valley. Um, originally, they said that they thought they could irrigate 175,000 acres. And as they started to develop these ditches with mules and hand digging them, they quickly realized that we don't have any water uh, or insufficient water. And by 19 or 1890, they had about 30,000 acres in production and they were out of water. So they determined that they needed to come up with some alternative sources. And I cannot imagine who thought of the idea, let's go down to the bottom of this giant canyon and, and figure out that we are at a higher elevation than the West Portal. So generally speaking, and I don't know if anybody's been down to the bottom of the canyon and seen the East Portal, but it lies right in this area here. And it, it's magnificent. Um, <laughs> So when they started the process, the Uncompahgre Valley water users went to the state of Colorado and appropriated 25,000 bucks and started digging. They made it about 300 feet in and they went bankrupt. Uh, so along the right same time, 1902, the Office of Reclamation Services, which is now the Bureau of Reclamation was formed. And as Kathy mentioned, we were for, timing is everything. You know, there is still a little bit of argument, depends on who you are. There was two projects that were right there at the cusp, but since we're here today, we're going to say we were the first. <laughs> we were the first one that was approved. So they began, it was approved in 1904, they started construction, and they hold out July 6th of 1909. There is some dispute, two feet, 18 inches, few, just a few inches apart. I mean, they were spot on. It's a, it's a, it's an amazing engineering feat. It is on this National Registry of Engineering. Uh, so we began to divert water in, in earnest. They, and at the simultaneously, you know, they're building the South Canal. And they're building all of these larger canals. So what happened is they solicited all the farmers and said, if you want into the project, we need you to transfer your water rights to the main. So we have water rights along the, we have water rights along the Uncompahgre River. But we also have water rights in the Gunnison River. And so they transferred their water rights to our, one of our key structures, which is called the m and Canal, Montrose and Delta Canal. And it is right off the of Trout Road. Um, it is our longest canal, 34 miles long. That Montrose Delta Canal ends up right out in here. Um, it's not, it doesn't carry our most water, obviously the South Canal does, but it, it does divert close, a little over 525 cubic feet per second. Um, we have seven canals. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. Let's go back to the history a little bit. So they, yeah, they hold the canal out, they hold the tunnel out, and started diversions in earnest, adding more land into production. And now that they have more of a reliable water supply, um, you know, it grew to its present day state of right around 83,000 acre feet. Actually, we service a little bit more because one of the unique things is some of these participants early, our homesteaders, they, there's some canals in here that are priority water rights. They didn't buy into the project. And so, but we still carry their water for them under a contract. We have carriage contracts. So some, some folks in here will have water rights under the project and then they will also maybe have some priority water and we kind of keep that on an accounting sheet separate and deliver that water for irrigation. Um, but we charge them a maintenance fee because we're actually conveying it in our canals and maintaining our canals for their delivery. Uh, so we are the largest diverter of Colorado River water in the Western Slope. We, we divert between five and 600,000 acre feet a year. Um, the majority of that water comes through the tunnel that tunnel capacity, we have a water right at the tunnel for 1,250 CFS. Yeah. Right conditions, good head pressure, we could probably get right around 1,190 in the tunnel right now. Um, and then, uh, then we make up the balance of it out of the diversions with out of the direct flow and natural flow in the Uncompahgre River. 
as Kathy mentioned, our system extends, and that's why I kind of zoomed out a little bit. We also operate Taylor Park Reservoir, which holds around 106,000 acre feet of water. And so what, the way our system works is that early in the year, we have a, and it's a challenge throughout the state, we have what's called the April Hole, meaning that all of the property, all the land down in the lower basins here, they're, they're ready to farm. The runoff hasn't hit yet. And so we have a challenge, you know, the creeks just haven't fired up, but there's a huge demand out there. So we need to make reservoir releases early in the season to prop up that water until runoff really takes force. So we, that's the purpose, that's the primary purpose of the Taylor Park project. When we're shy, when the amount of water flowing into the Gunnison is less than what we demand at the tunnel, then we'll make, actually the release, it's an accounting exercise, but it's our water, but the release comes out of the Blue Mesa Aspinall project. And we get that 1,000 CFS plus early on in the year. Uh, and then we can supplement it with some water out of Ridgeway Reservoir. It's just off the map here, and we control about 25,000 acre feet in Ridgeway, and I'll get a little into a little bit more detail about that in a minute here. So early season, we look at our system, and, and our, I usually we start, oh, first part of October is when the, you know, the onion guys are the first that want the water. It's, you gotta get water on onions early, and so they're, they're chomping at the bit. I mean, they would want us to open it three to four weeks earlier if we could. Half the time there's still, this year, there was still snow in the ditches. I mean, that we really had a, you know, it's, we had a great year, but it put a, presented a, a different set of challenges to us because all of our farmers got you know, backlog. They couldn't get machines in the field. You know, having too much water is also a challenge in, in agriculture. Uh, so we start the year and we'll be diverting the water. You know, typically our irrigation, you know, they'll start at the bottom end and move their way up the valley as the snow recedes. Um, we have a cutoff line, I would say, that 90% of our row crop, corn, onions, and beans takes place kind of north of, uh, you know, somewhere between Montrose and Olathe here. And then most of the production up here would be maybe a little bit of field corn, but predominantly alfalfa, grass, hay mix. Um, and I, I think that we're probably at about a 50% uh, alfalfa mix, and then 50% would be a combination of all of the different row crop vegetables and corns, field corns. So in addition to being a irrigation company, we also deliver water for municipal uses. So I've brought all of your purchase water either through Tri-County, Minokin, uh, Chapita Water System, or you know, the you know, town of Olathe, Delta, there's what they call Project 7. And those are the six purveyors of water, and we're the seventh component to Project 7. So at, out of the tunnel and the South Canal, we deliver water to Fairview Reservoir, which sits right outside of Montrose here, year-round. We deliver water in the summer, they divert it, and then in the winter months, we operate the tunnel every two weeks. We turn it on for about a day to top off the reservoir so they can have, a, they have about two weeks supply, three weeks, and we just we keep the reservoir full for them throughout the winter months. Um, so the, these entities have a reliable supply of water. In exchange, they have, they all own water in Ridgeway Reservoir. Project 7 is the largest. They're the largest controller of Ridgeway Reservoir, and so what happens is we, we exchange water. For every acre foot of water that we deliver to them out of the tunnel and out of the canal into the Fairview Reservoir, we get an acre foot of water in Ridgeway for our use later in the year. Um, it, it works well for us. I wish Ridgeway was a little bigger. We could have more, but um, that's the one benefit of having Ridgeway Reservoirs. You know, our tunnel is big, but it has its limitations. I mean, if we were solely reliant on the Gunnison Tunnel, we could only satisfy 50% of the demand in the river of the farmers. If that tunnel is the 
That is the artery to this valley. If it's gone, this place would not look anything like it looks today. Uh, so we are heavily reliant on it, very protective of it. Um, and, uh, it, and it's a challenge because it was, like I said, it's, it's 120 years old almost, and uh, it looks much the same as it did in many places when they first constructed it. So and I don't know if, it, has anybody been through the tunnel? I know they used to allow back. How do you get there? How do you get to the tunnel? <laughs> so the East Portal, if you, if you go into the Black Canyon Park, and you drive down the East Portal Road. Once you come to the bottom of the T, you know, kind of there's a campground that goes back where you can continue on to Crystal Dam. There's a couple of buildings right there. That's where our head gate is. There's that, it's like a timber crib check structure across the river. And that's where we um, divert the water. And it comes out, oh, the West Portal lies. Um, if you go up 50, there's a Miguel Road where it ties in. There's a little shooting range and all that just to the, South of that is where the tunnel day lights out and the South Canal begins. Uh, you know, I know back, I've heard stories that back, you know, they used to allow the scout trips and they take people through it. 9 11 changed a lot of that. So we, uh, we, we don't really, we go in and inspect it. It's very controlled who we let in. And it's off of, always during the winter months. Um, obviously, it's, it's a long, tunnel and um, uh, it still contains quite a bit of water even just seepage and things like that throughout the year so every year and that's one of the challenges we face we see that there's a lot of water here but I don't know if anybody here is an ag but we you know every year we look at our snowpack last year it wasn't great it was an average year but we had real dry soil moistures and we had to go to percentages actually this year right now we're on some percentages down on this west end because we have a capacity issue. It's just our infrastructure cannot physically get water from the river to the far end. We really rely heavily on some of these little side tributaries. And every one of these canals, we're picking up water everywhere. And one of the things that makes us pretty unique compared to um, the Grand Valley Project or some of these others is we use water seven times, at least, before we lose control of it. So it's rolling across seven different fields. We capture it in drains, we put it back in other ditches, we divert it at different farms. So on an average year, and still could happen this year, I'm not putting it out of the question, last year it was most of the year long, we drive the Topography River up in Olathe. There is nothing going by. So we, and in order for us to do that, what happens is, is we, like as I mentioned, we have water rights on the Uncompahgra. These are the old ditches that were dug in the 1800s that they moved to our m and canal, which sits right here. If we're short of water, I call Bob Herford with the Colorado Division of Water Resources and say, Bob, I need to place a call. And I said, I'm sweeping the creek right here at Olathe and I need more water. When we place the call here, we call out 80% of your county water users. He shuts them off for good. And that, that happens more often than they would like. You know, it's, it's, a hot, it's a political hot potato, you know, we catch a lot of pressure for it. And we have to prove that we're, we're using the water, we're diligently putting it to a beneficial use in order for him to enforce that call. So they really monitor us here. They're out there looking at the gauges, physically checking us to make sure that we're putting the water to use. Uh, some of the challenges that we face is because it is a big system, you know, moving water around, and the inflow from the, you know, the Compagre has a very big diurnal in it. So Cow Creek is one of the major contributors this time of year to the Compagre River, and it comes in just below Ridgeway Reservoir, it comes into the Compagre. Well, on a, during runoff, it will bounce every day because all of the snow is melting up high in the mountains and during the day, but it freezes back at night, and we get this big swing in water. And that bounce just keeps coming down the river, and then it, it affects each one of our seven primary head gates. So we have, like I said, we have seven head gates, the first being the M&D Canal and the West Canal. 
So right at the tail end of the South Canal, somewhere right around in here, uh, we flew water over the Uncompahgre River into the West Canal, and it runs down our western portion down into the Chavano Valley. The M and D Canal is our next one down, and then we start naming them after forefathers of Montrose. We have the Lautzenheiser Canal, which irrigates off to the east side of the valley, and most of the subdivisions, uh, bridges, golf course, or the Black Canyon Golf Course, all the way down to a little bit past 50. And then the Selig Canal, which diverts out right off of La Salle and heads out to the to the east side as well and starts to work its way down country. And then the Ironstone Canal, which is just outside of Olathe, which start, is another, it's our second largest canal on the main stem of the Uncapagre, about 400 cubic feet per second. It heads off to the west and the M&D joins it very at the tail end here. And then we have the East Canal, which diverts out of Olathe and heads off the east side down into and it tails down in this Peach Valley area. And the last canal is the Garnet Canal, which is oh, it's just past the Montrose County, Delta County line, and it diverts out to the east and it covers this area in the Delta. Um, so it's a, it, there's a lot of moving parts. And some of the stuff that we've done recently in the last, and I say recently in the last 25 years, is part and we're continuing to work on our in some ways there are efficiency improvements, but it's part of the salt and selenium program. So over the last 25 years, we've put over 120 miles of pipes in. We pipe these bigger ditches and laterals, predominantly on the east side, and that's a huge reduction in the amount of salt that goes into the river. Uh, right now we're projected, our last audit states we're putting, we're saving about 62,000 tons a year of salt from going into the river. Um, so every year, and we're starting, a, I'm, I'm about ready to start another grant for our phase 11 project, and we do a salt analysis to see how much more we can save to get these federal dollars to help us for water quality. Um, most all, we are a nonprofit, so most all of our major infrastructure improvements have to be uh, conducted through some sort of federal grant process. Um, so we're not passing that. It's just the costs are astronomical when you start looking at piping 16 miles of ditch with 36 inch pipe. So uh, how we've changed over the years, another component that I don't know how many folks know that we see a few of them, but we have five hydroelectric plants currently in operation in our system. Four of them are on the South Canal before it dumps into the Encapagre. And one of them is out here in Chavano Valley. So we partnered with DMEA on two of them. Uh, we have a, the contractor that constructed them we're partners with on two of them. And Uncle Pargary owns one of them 100%. And we've just started construction up here at Taylor Park Reservoir on another one this summer. Hopefully that will be done by December. We're partnering with Gunnison County Electric on that. So these are all you know, it's great for clean energy. Um, one of the things is though, the drawbacks is they're called run of the river plants. We cannot specifically call for water for power production. Power production is a secondary benefit. We are an irrigation company. We just use that water passing through because it's non-consumptive to help generate some revenues um, for us. Our, our power plant at Taylor Park will be operated uh, 365 days a year. It's just designed to take the, the base flows um, through the reservoir. The big challenge up there is they don't, we make the power, but they don't have a way to get the power from that point out into the grid. So as we work on that, and it's interesting because this dam that we operate was built in 1937 and they contemplated hydropower then. <coughs> We just took us a little while to get around to putting it in. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so as I mentioned, all of our, you know, one of the things too is when we, when we took over the project, we took over the project in 1932 from the Bureau of Reclamation. Uh, we occupied the original Bureau of Reclamation office on 6, 601 Park Avenue. Um, we operate our system under a contract with them. Uh, it's a 1948 contract. And 
<coughs> your reclamation owns everything. They own our facilities, they own our water. The only thing that Uncle Padre really owns, we own pickup trucks, a couple of backhoes, and <laughs> some of that. <laughs> uh, but so we're we're at the you know we're not at the murder we're partnered with the bureau. If you listen to the news over the last year, it, it really gave us some concern. Um, you know, a, little, a year ago, a little over a year ago, the commissioner for the bureau of reclamation went before the Senate and said we are going to maintain the integrity of the Colorado River Basin without regard to water right, and that left a nice cold chill up the back. Why that? Um, because we don't control our system. They, you know, they are the, we, we operate it, but they control, they own it. Uh, so we've been monitoring, uh, discussing with them, uh, and, and advocating our, you know, our position over the last year, and I think they understand it. Um, but that doesn't mean that, you know, I think that the, the the issue with the basin stabilization, Lake Powell, Lake Mead, that's a problem that the lower basin is going to have to solve. You know, what we've tried to do, and, and I think somewhat successfully, is we've been giving tours. I brought last year, I had the folks from the uh, Imperial Irrigation District, all of that Imperial Valley, the Coachella, and, and uh, Palo Verde districts, uh, to show them how our system operates. Last week, I had the Central Arizona Project up here, their board of directors. And it's, it's vastly different. In the Imperial Valley, they use water one time and it runs to the salt the sea. They want to keep it going into the salt sea because they've created a bit of an environmental issue there. It has nothing to do with their irrigation, but um, that, that's something that they're going to have to address. Uh, I think the Central Arizona Project, too, they didn't understand water rights administration in the sense that they think, oh, we're going to have to cut water. And they didn't understand that our water users outside of our system, they're curtailed every year. Our farmers have had to make decisions on following ground 17 of the last 23 years because we could not give them a reliable water supply. They pay 100% every year. They just don't get it. In, in, in the Imperial Valley and in the Central Arizona Project, they pay for their water, they get it. Just like turning on the tap at your house. It's pretty wasteful, um, you know, and, and, but that's why they've drawn Powell and Mead down to the levels that they have. They've lived with that security for the last 20 years. We have zero security. And it was, it was unfortunate this last tour because we would look at the San Juans and they'd see this white. The Imperial Valley folks, I showed them and there was not a flake of snow up there. It's like, that's our supply of water right there. Take it in. We, we just don't have it. And they drove by, you know, Blue Mesa last year, largest reservoir in the state. As comparison, their four bay for the Central Arizona Project and the Metropolitan Water District for LA is Lake Havasu. It is almost just a little bit smaller than Blue Mesa Reservoir. And they only operate, they never let it go more than two feet low. Two to three feet. It's just their four bay for pumping. And it's just evaporating like crazy where we were in about 25% capacity last year. And not sure whether we'd refill it. I don't know if anybody's been by it, but this year's been a blessing. It is full. Or as full as they want to operationally keep it. They will drop it back down to about 500,000 acre feet uh, this by the end of this fall. And mainly that is because when the flows come down the Gunnison, if it's too full, it starts icing back up the river and causing problems. So um, yeah, for all practical purposes, the, res the reservoir is fully operational at 100% capacity, as is Ridgeway Reservoir right now. Last year, it didn't fill. So. And, and when we start to talk to them about this is this is all we have for water supply, it, it's not much. It will not go far. You know, we, we say we have 100,000 acre feet in 106,000 feet acre feet in Taylor Park, and about 25 in Ridgeway. That's a quarter of our annual demand. And you know that that's so we 
it's not like we can rely on that to get us even going this year, any, on any given year. We are, we are really solely dependent on Mother Nature. So, uh, and those are the challenges that we're looking at in the future is how do we not only want educate people downstream that we're living within our means, but, and that's the thing is the farmers here, the people learn, they learn the hard way. They just have to learn it by doing it. They haven't been compensated for it. So when you read these, that's the challenge. They see these things in the paper where they want to curtail their uses in the lower basin, but they want $1,500 an acre foot to do that. And you may have seen some newspaper articles in the Grand Valley about folks, and that there was a pilot project that they tried to push out last year, late, that would allow us you know, to, to have farmers fallow ground. They wanted to compensate them $150 an acre foot. They, they launched the project in December. Every one of these farmers has already bought their seed, they've made their contracts and their commitments long before then. I mean, so, and, and 150 wouldn't cover their fuel costs. So there was a zero participation, really. Um, and, I mean, with, with good reason. I think they're going to try to, they've announced that they're going to try to think it through a little bit more. They admitted it was done hastily and maybe come up with something that would offer the option. Our main concern is anybody that participates in it we want to make sure that we're not injuring our other water users that aren't participating because we are so heavily relying on those return flows. If we take water, or somebody participates and says, well, I'm not going to convert water here, how is that going to impact the rest of the system? And that's something that we really have to take a hard look at to make sure that we're protecting the interest of all of our shareholders. So challenges that we face today, and Kathy had mentioned about canals, uh, easements. Easements are our biggest challenge. And, you know, with the development that's going on here, you know, we've got the canals that run through and the laterals are going through people's backyards because they're a federal project and, and the federal government, when they came in, some of the system they claim, is anybody here from the planning department? <laughs> some of the folks they claim, the, the bureau said that they have purchased this system, be simple. They have title to it. And there's always been this discrepancy. Is it an easement? Is it be simple? Uh, you know, as we get this development, we have a lateral going through there, we've got some set easements. On our big canals, it's 100 feet, 50 feet from the center line. And it kind of scales down. Some of the smaller ones, it gets down to 37 feet, so 17 and a half feet from the center. There's garages, sheds, living rooms. <laughs> couple canals down in there, and they say, can you come and clean my canal? And I told one person, you're gonna have to open your sliding glass door. <laughs> I gotta bring a cat through there to clean it. You, you give it. I can't get a pickup truck between the canal, and but they're saying it's, it's gonna flood out. It's like, well, you, you didn't obey by the easement. I don't know how, that's one of the challenges that we really have is, is the easements here um, on how, we're, how to address those. Um, again, they are, all of the canals are either on private, most of them are on private property. So, you know, as far as, you know, people are saying, well, we can walk the canal bank. There is a trespass. Those people do, either the federal government or those people do own that property. Um, so that's always something that's, it, it's a fight access utilizing the canal banks, maintenance roads for access to subdivisions and things like that. It all has to be done through the Bureau of Reclamation. There's a process. Um, and it, we're finding a lot of times it was, there's a lot of sleeping dogs out there. We're trying not to kick too many of them at one time. Uh, so I, those are the, some of the major challenges we face today. Uh, one of the things that we're starting, and we just received a grant this year, is a drought contingency planning. You know, we're looking at, uh, science states that we're not going to have, you know, repetitive good years. Historically, if we have a real good year, it's followed by two or three dry years. So, you know, we're not, we're not you know, just this one year, you know, and I can't say it's a, 
you know, it's an apathetic cycle, but you know, we are not out of, we are being maybe out of drought. You see what they say, well, the state of Colorado is for the first time it's out of the drought index. But we can be back in the drought index in months. Um, that's just how it works. I'm, I, we're enjoying the fact that we have good water this year, but I'm already worried about next year. That's just how it works. As soon as they get that crop off the field, you hit the panic button until what are we gonna do next year? Uh, so we've started to uh, receive some grant fundings and we're working with some of the municipal providers and different interests in Uray County and within the watershed on a drought contingency plan. And basically it's just a decision making guidelines on how we're going to address this in the future. What are some of the things we have to consider to secure, you know, a, a, make sure that everybody in here has a municipal supply, a secure supply. Make sure that, you know, the farmers have the best available knowledge so they can make decisions on following and how we might address this in the future um, from a holistic point of view. Uh, and it's, it's, you know, because the no two days are the same. This year, the, you know, we started out great. I can tell you right now, with the temperature and the wind we've had been having, the evaporation on our canals, it's just eating us alive. I mean, we'll, we'll be short at one canal, and I'll tell the guys we need five feet down there, and they'll send 40. And it's like, well, that didn't make it. Send another 40, you know. And, and it's just nothing, you know, it's, every day is different. Clouds are my best friend. I wish we had more of them right now. Um, but it's, uh, it does present a lot of challenges. There's a lot of moving parts. It's a big system. It's the largest diversion, the largest single irrigator in the state of Colorado. And we're the largest diverter of irrigation water. And as I mentioned before, so our, the reason we're looking at this drought contingency and system management is at some point in time, if they do come after someone, they're going to look, we're going to have the biggest target on our back. So we at least want to be prepared to say, this is what we, this is what we can do, this is what we can't do, and this is what we won't do. Um, you know, to protect the interest of our shareholders and the integrity of our system. So, uh, with that, I, I'd like to entertain any questions you may have. Yes, ma'am. I have two just, other, I just guess, political questions. One, one minute. Oh, okay. Let me explain how we do things. Can Sarah a lot of new people? Um, it is question time, not comment. So keep your what you have to say to your questions. And we circulate the mic because it's being televised. And for them to pick up our voices and, and be carried so people can see it at home, we have to use the mic. So if you would raise your hand, I'll get the mic to you, and then you can address your question to Steve. Sorry. Actually, I have two questions, and I think they both have a historical. Um, how does someone as far downstream of the uh, Gunnison River system as Montrose have rights to have a reservoir way past Gunnison, way up in Taylor Park? How do the rights work? So well, I, how, I mean, from a historical perspective, how did, uh, was this purchased by the BLM and given to us? Does Gunnison have rights in the Taylor Reservoir? Gunnison has, the Upper Gunnison has a secondary right. There's a second, there's multiple fills in the reservoir. We control the first fill. So the first 106,000 acre feet is under the control of the Uncompahgre Valley water users. As we release it and there's more water, which there is, there's a second fill. And I mean, the federal government built the reservoir and they filed on the water rights up there. Now, anybody can file on the water rights. It's where you use the water, which they're planning to use it in the you know, Compagre Valley. That's pretty consistent throughout the state. You know, there's water is, to give you a broader picture, water is released out of Green Mountain Reservoir up by Summit County to be used in the Grand Valley. Under, um, you know, it's just a, it's, as long as the water can physically get there, you can use it in any one of those locations. Okay, and my second question, I remember reading some articles about how they were managing drought and irrigating things on the Front Range, primarily um, municipal uh, irrigating, you know, lawns and golf courses and things like that. And they made it a point that you can only use the water once. 
Um, and I got the impression that was a law. I know water law in Colorado, I know, is it is, it is ambiguous. And I'll say, here's how we can use it twice, or multiple times. You can use it and as long as you maintain dominion and control of the water. So, this is Bob Herbert, if there's any water attorneys, we can have to discuss that. But, you know, so we use the water, we measure, we remeasure, we, we're maintaining control of it. We lose control of it somewhere right around in here. So as long as you're maintaining control of the water. Secondly, it depends if there's a call on it. So right now, along the Uncompahgre and the Gunnison River, and down into the Grand Valley, there is no shortage of water. So there's no entity downstream of us that's short of water. So they're not placing a call. When a call comes on, it, it's completely, it's, it resets everything on how the Division of Water Resources has to come in and manage it and make sure that you only use it once. Right now, without the call, you know, we, we have senior enough water right, but let's say you, you're down here in Delta, past Delta, and you want to put a pump in the Gunnison River, you don't need a water right. You can put the water to beneficial use. Once a call comes on, the Division of Water Resources is going to say, now you have to shut off. And they, that's how they go into the priority system. But using water, you know, as long as you capture it and you're, you're reusing it, and our issue too is it has to be used, it's tied to the land. All of our water is tied to the land, so it has to be used on project lands. We can't take our water and put it outside of our project. <laughs> All right, so as you mentioned, water is a finite resource. Um, and I'm curious to know, how has the use of the water in the area impacted the indigenous population? And is anything being done to work with the tribal communities? Um, that, it, it, read the paper. I mean, Becky Mitchell's the director of the, well, Becky has a new title. She is, she was the director of the Colorado Water Conservation Board. And now then, and the tribes, now she's the Colorado's representative of, on the Upper Colorado River Commission, and twice has been, but that's kind of her sole focus is the Colorado River. Uh, you know, the tribes in Southern, the Ute and the Southern Ute, um, I think Colorado's probably done a better job than most states about bringing them into the fold. The, the challenge is quantifying the water right, um, and this is kind of getting out of our purview, but more into the legal aspect of the water. Um, but quantifying the water right and the issue isn't so much quantification, it's how they get it from point A to point B. You know, yes, they have water rights in the Colorado River. Where they want to put it is 100 some odd miles, and they don't have any infrastructure. And I don't think they have the ability to put the infrastructure in. So there, there's recently there's been a Supreme Court ruling on, on those reserve rights too. And that's something we're working through. I, I will say that I think Colorado is probably further ahead of, in the game as far as working with the tribes than some of the lower basin states. Uh, it, uh, to tag along with that, um, the, uh, the BLM actually does the uh, administrative and legal aspects of, of the Southern Ute tribes. Um, the uh, question I have is about evaporation. The uh, putting in the, um, all the uh, piping obviously reduces evaporation problems within the system, is that correct? Yes, it, it does help. And piping is a, it, it's done many great things for us and it's also a double-edged sword for us. Because once you put things in pipe, it, it, it relieves or it impairs your ability to recapture return flows. And that's where we put a lot of pipe here. This, this tail end is just, it's, we've caused a lot of problems administratively because historically, we would capture water throughout the system. Now it's all in pipe, and we have to refigure out how we're going to manage water to keep water going to the tail end. So yeah, I mean it. It does reduce evaporation. It does improve the selenium and salt issue as far as not letting so much in. It really impairs the irrigation. So the so the recapturing of the water basically goes into the ground. Because that's where I know it runs. It runs into a drain and makes it back to the river that, that we're not able to re reuse our water in our in our system. So now we're pulling instead of 
you know, if the, if the canal came out here and we were, we were capturing the water and continuing to reuse it, we can't, so we need to send more water out of the, from the head gate down. And when we're short here, then we've got to put a call on up here, cut more people off. So, yeah, piping is a great thing, but if it's done with a, a lot of thought. And, and, and recognizing that there are a lot of unintended consequences, and that's one of the things that we're really working to address is we want to make sure we, we're uh, you know, as efficient as we possibly can be, at the same time we still have to operate a system. Yeah, my, my uh, irrigation well uh, runs from the groundwater that I think is uh, filled by the uh, water you know, seeping down from the ditch. <coughs> Is there, uh, the, the other question I have is, is there anything in uh, the works looking at uh, covering, um, you know, some of the canals and covering, you know, like Taylor Reservoir with uh, a material that won't uh, allow uh, evaporation? I don't know if there's anything that's out there. I mean, there's, that's one of the things is there's a great, there's, there's a lot of great opportunities out there. The problem is, is how do we pay for them? And I could give an example. In 2017, we received a grant. We had a, a Cal Poly came out, and they looked at our entire system. They did a system analysis to determine where we were with aging infrastructure, how can we make improvements, things like that. And they gave us a list of, I think there's 87 improvements. If I take the top 10 in 2017 dollars, I'm at 650 million. And we're a nonprofit. I charge my shareholders so much for a share of water. <laughs> and it would just, it just, it's, we don't even bother looking at it because I, I can't come up with it. I mean, it'd be $50,000 a share. It costs you $60,000, $70,000 a year to irrigate your front yard. Um, it just, it, that's one of the challenges that we're really up against is what we can physically do within our system, economically, practically, and then because we're dealing with the government in a timely manner. We have to have NEPA compliance, we have to have cultural, um, there's just a litany of hoops <clears throat> to jump through. Steve, I heard that this whole thing is gravity fed. It was that accurate? Correct, we do not pump any water. Wow. So if you look at through, as you go to the, the different mesas out here um, in Chavano, we have flumes, siphons, we do not have one pump on our system. Even at the portal? The Even portal's at the portal. higher than... The portal is higher. Like it, it, yeah, yeah, it, it is. A, and, and interest back to the portal real quick. If, if conditions are right and you get in there, we can get about, eh, I'd say, a half a mile in. It's the, the portal tunnel is 5.9 miles long. If we get about a half mile in and shut the headlights off, you can see a little pinpoint of light. And uh, that's that's the end. It's it's amazing. Yes, sir. You mentioned recapture and reuse two or three times. Could you explain that concept a little more? Um, maybe from the perspective of an acre or foot of water goes into the Gunnison Tunnel. How much of that actually makes it to the um, Gunnison River and Delta? So yeah, absolutely. So we, we divert the water, and when I say capture, recapture, and reuse, and, and here's another one of the challenges that we face with development. <coughs> Let me start there. If you had, let's say, we had a 40-acre piece of ground, the the, wa the way that the water was allocated in back in the 1800s, early 1900s, is they called the duty of water. They figured out how much water, how much water it took to irrigate 40 acres of land. And in some places it's about a CFS, other places about 7,500, 7,200s. So the way those farms were meant is you, you put the water at the top of your farm and you irrigate halfway down, you catch it in a ditch and you move it over to another 10 acre pasture and you keep moving it through. You don't irrigate all 40 acres at the same time. You don't have the water for that. So that's how I say you're, you're capturing it in a ditch you're moving it to the next tenant, and not everybody's property is a nice square parcel. So they have to catch it in the waste ditch, deliver it, keep moving it down the problem. They can't just water their whole 40 acres at the same time. So now when you have multiple farms, 
once they lose control of it, that water was intended to go to the next farm down and the next farm down. So it keeps going from farmer to farmer. But we can, if you allow me to zoom in, I can really show, give you a great depiction of water quality here. Let me drive here, I can speak right here for a second. So this is pretty interesting. So this is our South Canal right here. It's coming out of the Gunnison Tunnel, goes through a couple of different tunnels. This is a power plant right here. It comes down and it dumps into the Uncompahgre River. And this is the West Canal flume. So we flume water across the river right here. Now this heads out to the west side of the valley. Look at the color of the water. This is coming right out of the Gunnison Tunnel. It is absolutely pristine. So as we move downstream, this is our, this is the Montrose and Delta Canal. Still looks pretty good. Water's only been used one time at that point. If, then we continue to move down the river. Let me zoom out a little bit further. We're gonna make a big jump because we're going over the lots and Heiser, the Seelig, the Ironstone. So we get down to the East Canal. Uh, bear with me. Okay. I'm just gonna find it now. I know we have a shop out there. Here it is. So it's starting to turn a little, little browner. So and this is where we we normally dry the river up. So everything below it is return flow. And then we get down to our Garnet Canal, which is. Sorry, not, I normally have these all labeled. Here we go. So this is the Garnet Canal. It, it looks like chocolate milk. This is a little bit of water that's coming out of the river. And this is most of the water. You can kind of see the interface here between the return flow water and, and the uh, So yeah, that, I mean, water quality is a challenge. And, and one of the things that this kind of leads on to another issue is when everybody starts talking about conservation, they talk about what irrigation practices can you implement that would be saving water. One of them is drip. But when you're putting water that looks like chocolate milk into a drip system, <laughs> it doesn't work. Yeah. You just, I mean, it's just like, you're, you're putting it into a straw with these little tiny holes and you're immediately plugging them up and then you gotta rip everything out. So, I mean, it's been tried. Uh, I will say, I mean, farmers have put in drip, they've torn it out. They put in different sprinkler systems, they've torn it out. There's working from, there's not a one irrigation practice that really works. Everybody has to, and this could be from neighbor to neighbor based on how the return flows impact them. Uh, that, that is one of our biggest challenges. And the second one is, you know, and I'll, I'll, from the ag perspective, everybody says, well, let's grow a less intensive crop. Let's grow something that, you know, uses less water. But there's no market for it. These guys don't grow hay because they like to grow hay. They grow hay because they know they can sell it. They're businessmen. And they're running on a fine margin. So, I mean, once, once we create a market for something, they'll grow it. And there have been a lot of you know, stuff. You know, they've talked about some, uh, there's a project down the Grand Valley where they're trying to grow, uh, Nancy, what's it called? The Camelina. Camelina. They want to make biojet fuel out of it. Um, and it, it has a promise. It's less consumptive. But if there's a market for it, I guarantee you, if these guys can make money out doing it, they're going to be growing. That's the bottom line. Um, yes? I was wondering, who? can you tell me who controls the runoff on the Horsefly Creek, because it goes up and down and runs through our property. Horsefly you have Creek to is, with the Horsefly Creek? It's just a natural creek that runs into our system. Yeah, there's no, I mean, Mother Nature, that, that's about it. And this year, we you know, back to the Horsefly issue and, and further down, we work, you know, every year we work with the, the county, um, the city of Montrose and the county folks as far as how we can 
uh, help them when it comes to flooding. We had some issues down on Racine Road, the lower end of Happy Canyon. Uh, there was a lot of flooding this year, so we were taking less water out of the, the head gates of the main river and trying to take all of the water out of the feeders to lessen that impact downstream. So we work with them as best we can to uh, help alleviate some of those problems. And as far as a water intensive plant, isn't it true that marijuana plants are quite water intensive? Ah, uh, well, I'd, you'd have to ask an ag or some yeah. horticologist on that. I know that hemp is kind of a benefit of the experiment, but, right. you know, and again, it goes back to the plastic and the type of irrigation system. And yeah, it looks good on paper, and they may not have thought, how am I going to treat this water? And, um, just, and then a market. Market. We have time for one more question. Anybody? <laughs> <laughs> I can stay for a minute. You have a few questions. You, you mentioned several times this morning uh, salt incursion. Is that salt the result of agricultural and industrial use, or is it natural occurring salts that you're trying to keep from draining into the it, it's water. naturally occurring salt. If you you know you think about you see the dobies, they have that name for a reason. That's the make a shale, and it's very high in salt content. As that water hits it, it degrades it, breaks down. So they try to minimize the just the, the steady inflow of you know the canals. And the, every canal leaks. Every canal you know I mean. So the more we can keep in pipe and still operate our system, then the less we're allowing to seep through and leach those salts out of the soils so that would then be returned to the river. Thank you. One more. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I feel like you've touched on this a lot, and then you kind of mentioned it, but if you could tie it together. Are we a unique valley in that the water rights stay with the land? And is that because the water rights are actually owned not by the landowner, but early on you mentioned in the history part how they were the water rights were given to Uncle Madre Valley water users. Because I've always heard our valley is unique, the water stays with the land, and never quite understood it, how it, that worked. It does, because it is a federal project. Because it was federally funded, our water is tied to the land. So it, back to, to give a little bit deeper perspective, if you had 40 acres here, and you had it was all irrigated hay ground, and you decided to subdivide it, you don't control, when you subdivide that, it comes into our office and, and that water gets parsed out to the four 10 acre parcels. You can't hold any of it back, you, you know. Uh, and so it, we have a, a staff member and it's called under the Reclamation Reform Act, we track every acre of land and who owns it. There's certain guidelines, you know, you're only allowed to own so many acres in our system um, under that act. And so we, we, we monitor continuously every real estate transaction that involves our property to make sure that not one person is monopolizing the system. Um, and so that, that's a huge component of every deed we look at and transfer that water. And again, back to some of the discussion we had before tying in, our biggest fights are when you subdivide and everybody wants their water at the same time, the developers are not necessarily modifying the irrigation system for that farm or putting an irrigation system in. Even though there's an allocated share of water, they're not putting it away for people to get the water. So we have several subdivisions, not several, but we have some subdivisions where they have water, they physically can't get it to their houses because they didn't put the, or well, I guess, unless they want to rip up the roads, rip up everybody's and re-put it in after the fact and retrofit it. So that, that is a bit of a challenge for with development there is you know, how that water is tied to that land, but they physically can't get it on there because of changes that they make. We have a form of rule that we start at eight and we end promptly at nine and the police academy comes in.